So a little bit ago I did a video on kind of cycles in American political history and there was a great discussion following that video about what causes these cycles. But one thing that, that didn't come up there but I believe in strongly is changes in, in basically information technology and, and really media I guess in the bigger sense. One of the things we see when we go through dramatic changes in American history is dramatic changes in mass media. Um, and, and so for example if you look back leading up to the Civil War uh, well, you also, right before that time, see uh, the, the uh, invention of the Associated Press uh, because of the telegraph wire and the ability to spread news rapidly and the, the first real growth, the first real boom of, of newspapers. Uh, in fact, the Enlightenment, of course, which leads to the American Revolution and America existing in the first place, is in large part largely caused by uh, the printing press and the uh, uh, increasing availability of the printed word, uh, which means the spread of ideas, right? Um, We'll do more examples of this in a minute, but basically what happens is information is maybe the most important thing for a power structure to control. But when the ability to transmit information evolves, whether that be Gutenberg's printing press or the telegraph wire and the subsequent boom in newspapers with the rotary press uh, in the middle of the century, as that evolves, there will be a brief period of time, a short window, where the power structure loses control of the ability to control the message. Um, and then you begin to see other ideas uh, creeping into the narrative and they begin to screw everything up uh, for the status quo. Uh, in, in the, uh, of course in the, the 1700s, that, really going back to the 1600s, that would be a change in the entire theory of government from divine right to the social contract theory where the people should give their consent. In the mid-1800s, that will be the uh, introduction into the mainstream conversation of the morality and legality of slavery, um, which uh, uh, of course would dominate politics during that period. Uh, in the progressive era, we're going to see the penny press, right? I mean, uh, this is where we're really going to see uh, everybody reading newspapers, everybody getting information. Um, and before the massive consolidation of the newspaper chains, uh, the newspapers were printing all kinds of things and there was, there was really an unprecedented wealth of information. A lot of it was really bad information. It was overwhelmingly partisan information. Uh, but, but there was a loss of control of the, of the message. Uh, if, of course, if we look at the, 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 uh, the 1930s, we see radio come along. Um, and in its early days, radio was very uncontrolled before the network system came in and began to lock that down. Television in the 1960s, certainly you've heard that the, uh, the reason why the country turned against the Vietnam War in, in such a significant way was because they saw the images on TV. Well, why they see the images on TV? Because the government didn't understand enough not to let the damn images get on the TV, right? Uh, by the time we got to the Gulf War and stuff, they had figured out. You have to control that medium. You have to control what people are getting uh, their eyes on in this case. Same is true of the Civil Rights Movement. Martin Luther King figured out well before the, the, the people in power did, the people in, say, Selma did, that if you let the cops uh, beating the protesters show up on the television, the, the dogs and the fire hoses, you can see my video on 1963 for that, um, once that shows up on the television set, you're going to create sympathy and you're going to create outrage in the population. King had figured that out, but the cops hadn't. I mean, think about it today. If you tried to film that today, the cops would go and they would confiscate your camera, right? I mean, we see it over and over and over again with, with people's cell phones. You think you could stand out there with a, with a full, like, old-time 1960s news camera and film that stuff today? No, they're smart enough to understand that if those images get out in the public, people are going to turn against them. But they didn't know that in the 1960s. And so we have this amazing footage from Selma and the 1968 Democratic National Convention. Uh, the, 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 the National Guard pointing their weapons at the protesters, the, the kids shot in Kent State. I mean, do you really think that, 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 that all those images would have gotten out? Uh, think of the, the, the Vietnamese soldier, uh, who, who, uh, the Arvin soldier who shoots the Viet Cong soldier in the head. I mean, that image alone uh, did as much to unravel the Vietnam War as anything. Uh, they didn't understand it at the time. The, the power structure hadn't quite figured out how to control that. But they did. By the time we get to the Gulf War, uh, access into those, uh, uh, those war zones by the media is strictly controlled. Images coming out are strictly controlled. Today, protests are held in caged areas far from the site, uh, with, with, and they're made very difficult to cover by the news media. Now, the reason I bring all this up, uh, particularly is in the context of the Young Turks, because 
these days we have another one of these windows, don't we? We have the internet. And the internet is right now relatively uncontrolled. Now, we are all watching them try to control it as we speak with things like SOPA. But right now it's pretty uncontrolled. And so we are in a time of flux. We are in a time where change is effectively possible because information is moving freely and the power structure hasn't quite caught up with how to lock it down. Uh, of course, the Young Turks is the Young Turks. It's as big as it is, and most of you probably heard it, uh, because it used this, it, it took advantage of this window. I would argue that whoever it was at the Young Turks that said, hey, we need to go to the internet because radio is unreliable, which is how it used to be for the Turks, um, is as important for the success of that show as Jank or anybody else. No offense to Jank, he's great. But what the Young Turks did, what made them special, and what made them interesting and uh, provocative, was they were able to take advantage of this opening in the control of the media and the internet and get their message out in a real and authentic and meaningful way. Now here's the bad news. Those windows don't stay open forever. Uh, those windows close. Um, it will not be like this. I don't know when, but it's the, the internet is being a place where ideas are being exchanged as rapidly and as freely uh, and, and with the diversity that they are today that will only be around for a limited time. Enjoy it while you can. Uh, it can't be allowed to exist. Um, I mean, I guess this is incredibly cynical, uh, but if we look back at any time in our history where we've had this massive increase in the exchange of ideas, it becomes a threat to the power structure, and it does not last forever. Here's some other examples. Uh, I should have said these earlier, but... Uh, you know what the conservative movement used incredibly effectively in the 1960s, really beginning uh, with the campaign to get Barry Goldwater nominated in 1964? Direct mail. You probably don't think direct, direct mail is some great mass media technology, but it absolutely was. The ability to send your message straight to somebody who had reason to believe agree, agreed with you was enormously powerful. Um, and, and the guy who put that together was a huge supporter of Goldwater, and he got a list of people who he thought would support the conservative cause, and they were able to raise incredible amounts of money for the day uh, by doing this, as well as to get a narrowly tailored message to their supporters uh, without letting it get out to anybody else. So they could sell crazy to the crazies uh, and then put on you know a civilized, friendly face for the rest of us. Um, and, and they did that for decades. And that was, that was an enormously important part of building that. You, you think about these specialty publications like the National Review. Uh, and of course, these are on the left, on, on the left as well, the, the, the you know, Mother Jones and these sorts of things. We're able to tailor that hardcore uh, distilled message for those who wanted that while being able to keep this kind of centrist face on the rest of the party. In the 80s, another example of the conservative effort to do this is talk radio. Uh, by the 80s. Uh, now, now, rock and roll music became an important way to do this in the 1960s as we became a youth-obsessed culture. Um, and, uh, you know, we became very interested in what young, attractive actors and actresses uh, had to say and musicians had to say, and of course they tended to be liberal. Um, kids tended to be liberal generally, and so movies tended to have that message. Uh, the mass media was really uh, uh, challenging the system. Uh, you think of things like Easy Rider, for example, or almost any rock and roll. But by the 80s, those kids had grown up. Uh, they weren't listening to music in their car, particularly uh, men in their uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s, the baby boomers, a little bit older. And so they, but everybody gets in their car and turns on the radio, so they turn it on, and what they listen to? Talk radio. That was another evolution of media. That was another way that uh, this kind of window that nobody quite understood the value of um, uh, was exploited by people like Rush Limbaugh and his endless imitators uh, to, to impact politics, to shape a political message. It happens all the time. Today it's the internet. 20 years ago it was uh, talk radio. 20 years before that it was mail order and, and movies and, and music, although of course there's, that's still happening today to some extent. But it's much more controlled today. So anyway, this is my theory, that along with these changes uh, uh, in our politics and the direction of our country are these changes in the function of media and the way media is delivered. Um, so anyway, I'm curious to know what you think. Oh, I should also make one point because I promised this in my other video on media. Uh, the age of consensus. So 
In World War II, we, we began a period of enormous consensus, and Rick Perlstein writes about this, and I'm a big fan of Rick Perlstein's. And what he said was basically that from World War II-ish to, I don't know, late 60s, early 70s, there was essentially a consensus in this country where, where the media anyway, the mainstream concepts, agreed on most things. This is also a function of media to a large extent. Because in a time where there were basically three outlets for media, ABC, NBC, and CBS, because TV was where it was at, that's how we got our news, we watched TV. Um, all three of those had a, a, an incentive to move to the middle and try to craft the most mainstream centrist message that they could. And the reason is, is because they were fighting over a pretty big pie. And if, if they each, you know, theoretically were to get a third, if they just increased themselves by a little bit, they could, I mean, they were moving enormous amounts of advertising dollars um, by, by fighting over the, you know, 100% of people watching the news, because there was no cable, of course. Now, you may think, well, why didn't one of them just become crazy conservative or crazy liberal uh, and take their chunk of the audience and go off? Well, they couldn't, and here's why. They each had their own kind of loyalist for whatever reason. Maybe the news had a really good lead in, you know, there was a good show on before it. Or maybe those people were just loyal to that station because they had, they had been watching it for years. I know that out in Midland in the 1950s where my dad lived, I think they only got one of the three networks 24 hours a day. The others came and went depending on the winds or the sun was up or down or whatever. So they watched the nightly newscast because that's the one their TV got in the 1950s. And if they would have gone to the extreme, they would have lost this core, you know, whatever percentage that was for each network, they would have turned off a lot of that because, you know, they would have been putting out a, they would have been making the news partisan and turning those off. So they, they couldn't really move to extremes, and so they all moved to the middle and kind of fought over who would get the biggest chunk of that pie. I know for a long time, for example, Walter Cronkite was the big winner there on CBS. But they were all trying to do that. There was no incentive to, to try to break off a little chunk for yourself um, if you believed you could get more than, you know, 30% or so. Of course, with cable coming along, and then uh, you begin to have narrow casting where, where uh, networks gave up on that, as they, or, or not networks necessarily, but cable channels, because when you're splitting the pie 100 ways or 150 ways, um, you were never going to get more than a little bit. And so the incentive became to find your niche, find your chunk of the audience, and talk to it. And if you got 4% of the people watching cable in a given moment, you were doing pretty well. And so we moved from this period of, of everybody moving to the middle, towards this great consensus, uh, towards this narrow casting, everybody talking to their individual people. Of course, uh, the internet has made that much worse. Uh, or better, depending on how you see it, I guess, uh, where w with the endless variety of, 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 of news sites on the internet, um, you could go to a conservative, you can go to the Young Turks and you can get their perspective, or you could go to uh, you know, Fox News or, or, or whoever's out there and get their perspective, um, or you could go to your you know, extreme little thing and just watch My Little Pony videos all day long or something. So the consensus for that and other reasons has been shattered. Um, and has created a new media reality, and, and it is into that void uh, that we go now, and we have this window to have conversations that I don't think we could have otherwise. Uh, and I think, honestly, the Young Turks have been a huge player in that, and I think that phenomena has been a huge reason for their success. Not to say they're not talented, but there's lots of talented, smart people out there. Um, uh, I mean, they are talented, and they deserve it, but I also think that they are a product uh, of, of this particular evolution. Anyway, I'm Professor Rich. Uh, it was a little rambling and disjointed, but I hope you learned something.